Well, in 2012, a new form of atheism gave rise at the Reason Rally in Washington, D.C. It was called the New Age Atheism. And this New Age Atheism, it was led by a group of men, scholars, who called themselves the Four Horsemen of Atheism. And this was a more aggressive atheism than had been present in the past. Now, Atheism in the past has always been about religion being bad, right? That's not new to the beliefs and ideals of religion or of atheism, but they added a new stipulation that not only was religion inherently bad and false, but they also added the belief that its beliefs and ideals should not be honored in any capacity in modern society. Now, Richard Dawkins, who is the author of the book, The God Delusion, and one of these four horsemen famously said this about Christians at the end of his speech at the Reason Rally. He said, mock them, ridicule them in public. Now, 12 years ago, to say that we were to mock and ridicule someone openly in public, right, that would have been crazy, right? That's not something you did. Nowadays, not really as shocking, right? Mocking somebody's kind of like just another Tuesday. I mean, you can ask Sean. I, I think that it's become one of our staff values to make fun of him for being bald once a week. Like it's, it's got to make it through today. And it's safe to say that when you look at the kind of attitude that Richard Dawkins has about Christianity, you could say that his view on Christianity is less than stellar. But just one month ago, 12 years after calling for all of the world to mock Christians, Richard Dawkins went on an interview live in Britain, and he said this. He said, I call myself a cultural Christian. I feel at home in the, in the Christian ethos. Christianity seems to me to be a fundamentally decent religion. I find that I like to live in a culturally Christian country. Now, how crazy is that? The same man that 12 years ago said, mock them, don't treat them with respect, like they're, they're bad, he now says, we need Christianity. Because there is something inherently good about the way that God's word says that we're supposed to live. Now, I wanna be very clear. Professor Dawkins is not a Christian. He does not believe in God. He does not follow Jesus, but he recognizes the need for Christianity's influence in our society. So what is it about Christianity that makes it so important to our culture, right? What is so different about Christianity that even the very people who would deny its existence, who say it's fake, it's a fraud, it's a delusion, now start to see a need for it? It's love. Right? No other religion in the world offers the same kind of radical love that Christianity shows and calls us to. Right? It started with the greatest sacrifice in history where Jesus, because of his great love for us, died on the cross for the sins of the world. And he, after setting the example for us, now calls us to this same kind of radically different love. In fact, to Jesus, love was so important that he called it the greatest commandment. When the Pharisees questioned and tried to test Jesus about what the greatest commandment was, Jesus said this in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. He said, he replied, love the Lord with all your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus says, look, if you can figure out how to love, right, everything else falls into place, that this is the key for a good society, right? And so what's crazy is that the very people who don't believe in Jesus, the very people who deny his his, his uh, divinity, the very people who deny what we believe are now recognizing and acknowledging that his love is good. Right? Richard Dawkins, he does not love the message of Christianity, but he loves the love because there is something radically different about the love of Jesus that the world sees, and it's what the world needs. I think so often in the context of Christianity today, 
right? Like being a part of the world has kind of become fighting with the world, right? And so all the world sees is that we're in this constant combat. And so if what the world sees from us is what the world does, right? And so if all we're doing is we're arguing and we're fighting over what's good or what's wrong, or we're spending more of our time trying to counter cancel the cancel culture around us, we end up looking like the world and it falls flat. But if we can learn to love like Jesus, it'll change everything. If we love our enemies, and if we show a kind of love that it doesn't make sense in every situation, I mean, that catches people's attention. And it leads to the opportunity to share the truth of Jesus with the broken world. And if we can get to that place, then that is a game changer. So this morning, what I wanna do is I wanna talk about what does it mean to love like Jesus? And so here's the deal. If you're one of those people that finds yourself today in the camp of Richard Dawkins, right? Maybe you're somebody who you don't buy everything I say about Jesus. You're not totally convinced that he's the son of God. You're not convinced that he is Lord and Savior. Here's what I'll tell you. The same thing that Richard Dawkins is telling you, that if you can learn to love like Jesus, it's still beneficial to you. And I will tell you that if you will learn to love like Jesus, it'll change you. It'll change your family. It'll change your children. And I believe it'll change the world. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can open those up to Romans 12, and that's where we're going to be today. Now, the book of Romans is a letter. It's written by the Apostle Paul, and it's written to the church in Rome. And initially, the letter is written to kind of unified Jewish and Gentile Christians because there was a lot of fighting back and forth with them. But there's also a very large portion, pretty much the, the back two-thirds of the book, really are about teaching the church in Rome a lot of the basic beliefs, the core beliefs of Christianity. And when you get to Romans 12, Paul spends a massive portion of this chapter talking about this big topic of love and how we're to put it into action. So we're going to start this morning by looking at verses 9 through 13 together. It says this, it says, love must be sincere. Hate what's evil, cling to what's good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, Paul, he packs a lot into these first verses right here, but he starts with a simple truth. He says, love must be sincere. Now, when Paul wrote this in the Greek, he uses two distinct Greek words that are very important for helping us to understand the rest of this passage. Those two words are agape and anapokritos. Now, these words, agape, it means a divine love or a godly love. So this is an unconditional, sacrificial love. It is the same love that God has for us. It's the same love that Jesus displayed for us on the cross. And it's the same love that we are called to show to the world. And anapokritos, it means without hypocrisy. And the actual more literal definition is not a phony. It's not fake. It's genuine. And so what Paul is saying is that, one, we have to learn what is agape love, and then we have to live it in a genuine way. Now, there is a big criticism against the church by our culture. And what this is, is that the culture says, hey, man, the church needs to just show the love of Jesus, right? We don't talk about sin. We don't talk about repentance. We don't talk about obedience because none of that's important. What's important is that we just talk about God's love because that's what matters, is that he loves us. And there is some truth in that. We are called to offer the same unconditional grace that Jesus gave us. But if agape love is to be genuine, if it is to be anapokritos, it cannot be devoid of truth. Loving like Jesus, you'll often hear us say it like this here, is that it is walking in the balance of grace and truth. We believe that loving like Jesus means there is a fine line, a tension that we live in between sharing the grace of Jesus and sharing the truth of Jesus. And so what that means for us is we have to share the, the grace of Jesus, right? We, we welcome and we love and accept people as they are, no matter what they've done, no matter who they are. But that same love then calls us to lead them to a life of repentance because that's the same love that was shown to us. Now, Paul talks about the love of God this way in Ephesians 2, 3 through 5. 
He says, all of us also lived among them at one time. And he's talking about people who don't follow Jesus. He said, we are gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and its thoughts. And like the rest of us, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So here's the deal. We, by nature, are deserving of wrath. Every single one of us, we fall short of the standards of the glory set by God. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 3.23. And so what that means for us is that we are undeserving of God's love. We are undeserving of God's mercy, of his forgiveness. We do not deserve a relationship with him. Because from the minute that we had a choice, the minute we were in control of making the decisions, we chose rebellion. But here is the love of Jesus on display. He knows what you do. He knows what you've done. And it doesn't matter what the mistakes you've made or where you made them 20 years ago or 20 seconds ago. It doesn't matter how big or how small you think what you've done is. Jesus knows what you've done and he still loves you. And he loves you so much that he came to earth, God in the flesh. He lived a perfect life in our place, something that we could not do. And he died on the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And three days later, he rose from the grave. Through the cross, Jesus defeated sin. Through resurrection from the grave, he defeated death forever. And it's in Jesus that we now have forgiveness of sins. We have eternal life and a relationship with God. That's grace. It's unmerited, undeserved favor of God through Jesus. But here's where truth comes in is that in response to that grace, you were called to live a life of repentance, that we turn completely away from an old way of living to follow Jesus. Because in the same way that Jesus died for us, our old self has to die so that we can be made alive in Christ, that we are a new creation. And so following Jesus, if that's who you are, you are now a follower of Christ, you are called to a life of obedience. It's grace and truth. And so loving like Jesus requires walking through this balance. It is embodied through grace and truth. And so if we wanna change the world, if we genuinely believe that we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world through Jesus, right? The light on the hill, we love with grace and truth. And that's how we change the world. And it starts with grace. The love of Jesus means that we love our enemies. It means that we love people who are different from us. It means that we love people who are difficult to love. It means we love the very people who least expect that kind of love from us. And when we show that kind of love, when we demonstrate this kind of grace, then it catches people's attention because they don't, they, don't, they don't understand why we would love that way. But the love of Jesus is not simply grace. The love of Jesus is not just about accepting and welcoming people but it's about calling people to a life of obedience because we believe in love that we're called to a life that is far better than a life of sin. And so what that means for us is that we have to walk in this balance of grace and truth. We share grace first, but then we share the truth of Jesus because that's the next step. And hopefully if you've been at Kara City for any amount of time, you've gotten to see this kind of love on display. I don't know about you, but I don't think that there's a church that's more welcoming and loving than ours. And I know that sounds like bias as one of the pastors, but I genuinely believe that. And that's not me like trying to brag about us. That has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with Nathan. It has nothing to do with the rest of our staff. That's you guys, right? I can't tell you the amount of people that walk up to me after being a part of our church for a little while and they'll say, man, I was just blown away by the way I was loved and welcomed when I walked in the door. And I hope that as you've been here, you felt that. I hope that from the minute you walk in these doors that you were loved and welcomed, that you feel known and seen and heard because we believe you matter and you, we believe you're welcome here because we will show you the intentional grace that Jesus has shown us. But we will also share the truth of Jesus with you. We will stand firm in what we believe about the Bible and what it says about how we are to live. And so that means that we will talk against sin. We will talk about it and what it means to live in response to it. And so you need to understand that in love, we're not gonna shy away from hard topics. And in love, we're not gonna shy away from calling you to grow in your faith because we believe that genuinely loving like Jesus starts with the grace, but it should lead you to the truth. 
And so I hope that as you've been here, that has been demonstrated for you. But see, this is what's important, is that our love is not just grace. This is not, it's important that our love is not just truth. It is grace and truth. And if our love can embody that, it'll blow people away. It'll change the world. But here's the other part of this. In order to love like Jesus, you have to genuinely live in grace and truth. And what I mean by that is you can't just talk the talk. You gotta walk the walk. Amen. Look back at verses nine through 13 with me. Paul says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, if you've been here for the past couple of months, some of this is gonna look a little familiar to you. Now, maybe not in this exact wording, but really the qualities that Paul is saying embodies love here, I mean, these are all the things that we just spent five weeks talking about in our series Beyond Belief, right? These are kind of these areas of growth of discipleship. We talked about about them in the areas of consistent prayer, Bible study, making and growing disciples, and generosity with time and generosity with resources. And, and so Paul says, look, man, this is what it looks like for love to be genuine, that this is lived out actively. Now, Paul's point is not that you need to be perfect in order to love like Jesus. So don't hear that. But his point is that if you are going to show the love of Jesus, you must first be changed by it. And here's why this is so important. It authenticates the love that we show. Now, some of you know, if you've been here for a while, that I play guitar. I've been playing guitar for about 13 years, and I've had tons and tons of different guitars over the years. But my favorite guitar is a 1972 Gibson Les Paul Deluxe. It was my dad's guitar. He bought it at a pawn shop in Mississippi when I was a baby, back before pawn shops knew that old guitars were worth a lot of money. And he kept it, and when my, my father passed away four years ago, I inherited it. And it is one of, if not my most treasured possessions. I, and, and that guitar, man, it holds all kinds of value, right? One, there is a sentimental value there that's priceless to me, right? That guitar came from my dad. It's never going anywhere. I will keep it forever. But if I'm being honest with you, there's also a very real value in it. It's a 52-year-old American-made guitar. It's expensive. Gibson, the company that made it, is one of the two oldest electric guitar makers in the world. And they're a company that is synonymous with the ideas of electric guitar and rock and roll. Like if you think about rock and roll, especially from like the 70s to the 80s and even a little bit before that, man, Gibson's probably what you think about, right? And so these are expensive guitars made in America. They're good quality instruments. But because of that notoriety, there's a lot of fakes out there. And Chinese companies lately, like in the past like two, three years, man, they have just exploded with the amount of fake Gibsons you can find on the internet. And my favorite thing about this is the guitar company calls them Chipsons for Chinese Gibsons. And man, these things, I'm not joking, they're everywhere. You can go on Facebook Marketplace today and find them here in Houston. You'll find them on eBay. You'll find them on all those other websites that sell things like DHK and Timu and all that. They're all over the place. And what's even crazier is the fakes, if I'm being honest with you, they're getting pretty good. They're getting real close, okay? And, and so it's not uncommon. I'm in a couple of different groups for guitars, and I'll watch people post and be like, guys, I bought this $6,000 guitar for $200. And it's not real. But the fakes, man, they're getting so good that even somebody who, like me who has, has studied and, and learned a lot about these guitars, I mean, sometimes I have to stare and stare and stare at these replicas just to figure out they're not real because from a distance, man, they look like the, re the real thing. They look genuine. But when you start examining them up close, the facade starts to fade away. And so it'll be little things, right? Like it may be like the logo is like slightly off or at a different angle or misplaced and some cut on the body of the guitar won't be the right thing or it'll be some weird color. It'll be like the fretboard binding is different and some of that language just went right over y'all's heads and I apologize for that. But what you need to know is that when you start to examine these things up close, something doesn't line up. And all of a sudden, as you start to look at this, you realize, you say, it's fake. It's not genuine. It's a phony. And so this valuable thing suddenly becomes a piece of junk. And loving like Jesus works the same way. You can't show the kind of love that changes lives 
without evidence that your life has been changed by that love. And you can try, right? And from a distance, you can try to love like Jesus without being changed. And, and from a distance, it may look real. It may look like the real thing. But when someone starts to examine you up close, the facade will fade away. And, and let me tell you, the world would love nothing more than for your love to be hypocritical. The world would love nothing more for what you show and what you teach to be fake. Richard Dawkins would love nothing more than to be able to look at you and go, I love what you teach, but I hate the way you live. Because the world, and if what it hears is Jesus and what it sees is the world, what we offer is junk. But when they see the difference that Jesus has made in your life, when they look at you and they go, I, I don't understand it, but I can tell that, that you're changed. There is a weight and a value behind what you show and teach because they see it evident in your life. And this is why Paul says love must be sincere. It must be unapocritos, without hypocrisy, not a phony. So you gotta ask yourself this morning, what do people see in you? When they look at your life, do they see a devotion to Jesus? Do they see a passion for God and for his church and for his people? Do they see someone who's actively trying to live out their faith? Do they see the joy of Lord present in your life? Do they see that you're trying to love and serve people like Jesus? Or do they see a phony, a fake, just another cheap knockoff? And I'm not saying that asking you all these questions to guilt you into something. Like I'm not, I don't want this to be something where you walk away and you're like, all right, I gotta change everything in my life. And then it's just, it lasts like two days. Because here's the deal. None of us are perfect, right? Let's, let's get that out of the way, right? We are gonna mess up. No matter how hard we try, we're not always gonna get it right. And that's not the point here. But the challenge this morning, I wanna challenge you to step up. Let the love of Jesus change you first and live out your faith in such a way that it catches people's attentions, that it turns heads, that people cannot deny the change that has happened in your life. Now, I'll give you a couple of ways you guys can, can work on that. Uh, the first one is I wanna challenge you the same way we've been challenging you for the past two months. Grow in your faith with Jesus, right? Grow in your relationship. Work to be a disciple of Jesus who lives out what he has commanded. We spent two months walking through two different series death to life, and beyond belief. And over that series, we took a the time to challenge you and what, it, what does it mean to be a disciple? Why do we do this, right? But then we also took five weeks to talk about how do we practically live that out. And so if you wanna know what it looks like to follow Jesus, man, start there. They're great resources, they're free, they're on our website, they're on our YouTube page, they're on uh, Facebook, you can get them all different places. And man, these are great resources for you to learn what it looks like to follow Jesus. And hey, if you have questions about any of that, please come talk to us. Like I will answer any question I can. Nathan will answer any question you can. All of our other pastors and staff would love to talk to you about this and help you in any way. But grow in your faith because it's important to what we do. And the second thing I would challenge you to do is to work to be consistent in being at church. Now, I know that as a pastor, that sounds like, of course, you want us here every week. I bet you do. But being a part of God's community that he's called us to, right, being actively involved with his people, I mean, that's a command that he gave us. And so living this out is important. And so parents, I wanna to speak to you specifically for a second. Man, if you want your kids to make faith a priority for this to be important to them and something they actually want to do and enjoy to do, make it a priority for you. Make church a priority, being here on Sundays. I'm not talking that you have to have like perfect attendance like this is preschool, but work to make this a priority and be consistent with it because if you'll show your kids that it's important and they'll model that and live it out because that's the example that you set for them. The third thing I'll challenge you to do is get involved with serving. At Care City, we have tons of ways you can do that. We have a ton of mission partners who are amazing, and there are plenty of opportunities to get involved and serve people there. We also have teams here at the church that you can get involved in, and if you wanna know about any of that whatsoever, easy way you can do that. At the Connect booth, we have cards that list out all the ways you can serve. You can go on our website. It lists out all the ways you can serve, and we will answer any question you have. We will train you in anything you wanna be trained in and help you get involved in serving because it's important for us to serve in the same way that Jesus served us. But whatever it looks like for you, the challenge ultimately is show the love of Jesus, show grace and show truth, but then live in response to it. Show people, show the world what it looks like to live out your faith 
and live out this grace and truth. And I promise you, if you do that, and it will change everything. All right, look at our last verses with me. This is verses 14 through 21. It says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road with Paul's challenge to love like Jesus, right? Because it's easy to love like Jesus when it's reciprocated. When people love you, when people are kind to you and they're welcoming to you, done deal, easy, right? But loving like Jesus in the context of a broken and depraved world that's hostile towards you, it's hard. And I think this is where Christians so often get kind of hung up and mixed up in how we're supposed to respond to the world. Because I think we take the concept of spiritual warfare a little too literally at times, and suddenly we, we all of a sudden feel like Christianity has to be combatant, right? Like we've got to fight against the world. And so if we're not careful, Christianity suddenly becomes more about removing the bad in the world than it is about showing the world what's good. And I see this most often in parents, and this isn't me like picking on y'all, this is just my observations. And I would encourage you if you're like, I don't think that's true, just think about the parenting atmosphere around you. Think about your friends, think about social media, think about the schools you're in, and just think about what our culture is doing right now, right? Everything's warnings and boycotts and this calls for justice and reforms in schools and in government and all this stuff. And parenting, it's become so much about hiding our children from the bad in the world, right? And we put it under the guise of protecting them and sheltering them. But it's become all about fighting the world instead of teaching and empowering the next generation to live counter to the culture around them. And see, here's the problem with this. We're teaching our kids to fight against our culture the wrong way. Paul makes it clear in verse 18, an aggressive Christianity, false, incorrect, it's bad. It's not about beating the world into submitting to Christian ethics. It's about loving the world into life change. And so the issue with this is that we absolutely have to speak the truth of Jesus, right? I'm not saying that we need to have this soft version of Christianity that only preaches acceptance, right? It's grace and truth. And so, yes, we have to share the truth of Jesus, right? We must stand against sin. We must stand for what the Bible believes, but we lead with grace because that grace gives us the opportunity to share truth. And so if we do that backwards, and, and, and the way that we fight against the world is the same way the world fights against us when it's all about rage and slander and arguments and fighting and bickering and canceling and all this other stuff. And Paul would say, we've missed the mark of what it means to love like Jesus. Like if that's what our love looks like, we're way off. Tim Hart, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, said it this way. He said, when Christians are more well-known for what they are against than what they are for, we all lose. Fighting the world, the evil in this world, isn't about fighting the world. It's about showing the world a better way to live. And so what I would challenge you to do is instead of trying to boycott and cancel everything and call for all this stuff, I'm not saying some of that's not good, but I'm saying in the context of your children, and show them why the way the world wants us to live is wrong. And what I mean by this is, man, be willing to sit down and have hard conversations with your children. Be willing to have those weird and awkward conversations about topics you didn't think you needed to have yet, because I promise you, you do. And we have to show our children, what it looks like to live in response to the world because they are watching the way you do it and they're going to live it out. And this is why we have to lead with grace. It's why we have to let humility and gentleness and patience and empathy be what defines our interactions because it's through showing that kind of grace that we get the opportunity to share the truth of Jesus. And so, man, if we will lead with grace, 
We get to share the truth of Jesus with our children. We'll get to share the truth of Jesus with the, the people around us. We'll get to share the truth of Jesus with the world. And in that kind of grace, it will change everything because it leads to the life-changing truth. I love the way that Paul ended this section in verses 17 through 21. Look back at this with me. He said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Right? Do not take revenge, my dear friends but leave room for God's wrath for it's written. It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now there is something really interesting about the imagery of heaping burning coals onto someone's head. On one hand, it's a little funny, if we're being honest. I gotta know about you, because the first thing I think about is a movie like Home Alone, right? Because I can absolutely see Kevin McAllister just dumping hot coals on the Sticky Bandit's heads. And it makes me laugh every time I think about it. But on the other hand, there's something beautiful about the imagery of these burning coals. When talking about burning coals being dumped on someone's head, it's often an imagery of burning conviction in the Bible. And so what it refers to is this intense response to grace. And Paul uses this to describe what happens when we show the love of Jesus, the broken world, right? He says, they don't know how to respond to it. Cause I don't know about you, but what would you do if someone dumped burning coals on your head, right? If somebody dumped burning coals on my head, I'm not going, thank you, I appreciate that. I'd be like, no, what are you doing? Like, why did you do that? Right? And so Paul says, look, when, when we look at the world that looks at us and is hostile, right? we face persecution, we face mocking, we face bitterness and slander, even the threat of death. And when we love them in response to all of that, the world goes, why? Why would you do that? What is it about you and the way you live that would lead you to respond to me that way? I don't get it. It's the reason that people like Richard Dawkins can go, I don't understand why you would believe about Christianity what you believe, but I get why you love that way. Because it's different. And it's that kind of conviction, this burning conviction inside of people that go, I don't understand. It leads people to Jesus. Because that kind of radical grace, it leads people to ask, why? Why would you love me that way? And we've now opened the way for truth. See, it's why grace is important to us at Karis City. It's why it's in our mission statement. If you didn't know, our name literally means grace. Karis is the Greek word for grace. And our mission statement here is to show intentional grace to others one person at a time. Because we believe showing that kind of radical grace, man, it will change everything. When we invite people in, the very people who least expect it, man, we get the opportunity to share the truth of Jesus with them. And that's what I love about the way Paul ends these verses, right? In verse 21, he says, don't, don't be overcome by evil. Don't, don't fight the way the world fights because it's not gonna work, right? If we fight the way the world fights, we're fighting a losing battle. But when we respond with love, we respond with grace and let that lead people to truth and it changes everything. In the fourth century, there was a woman named Monica. And this is a real story, by the way, I'm not just making this up. Monica was a devout Christian, right? She, I mean, she studied the Bible, she, she prayed consistently, she was obedient to God, right? She was in church, right? She did all the right stuff. Monica had a kid, a son named Augustine. Augustine wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He looked at his mom and was like, what you believe, I ain't believing it, I'm out. So he walked away from the faith. He says, I don't wanna believe it, I don't think it's true. And he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live the way I want to. He, he quite literally devoted his life to sin. He was like, all that stuff, you say it and good, that's what I want, I'm in. Now, Monica had a couple of ways she could have responded. But I love the way that she chose to respond to her son. History tells us the first thing she did was she prayed consistently. Over and over and over and over and over and over. She sought the counsel of her church leaders, which at that time was a priest and a bishop, to see what to do. And then she chose from there, she said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love him. So in all the situations, all the stupid things that he did, all the ways that he went against God, she just offered grace over and over. No matter what he did, Grace, 
grace, grace, grace. And when she would get the opportunity, anytime she could, she would share truth. Eventually, Augustine, while on one of his many adventures, would undergo a profound conversion to faith. There was a bishop that led him to Jesus. And believe it or not, this dude who was like, I want nothing to do with Jesus, he went on to be one of the greatest thinkers and theologians of church history. It's St. Augustine, he's one of our early church fathers. And when asked about whom he credited towards his conversion, towards following Jesus, he said there were two people. He said, one, the bishop who literally led him to follow Jesus, but he credited his mom who never stopped showing him the love of Jesus. See, loving like Jesus changes everything. And so we can't fight the world the way the world fights us. We fight with love. Right? We fight with grace and truth in response to a broken world. And man, if we will do that, I'm telling you, you'll be blown away by what happens. Now, I'm no prophet. I can't sit here and tell you that somebody like Richard Dawkins is gonna come to know Jesus. I, I don't know that for certain, right? But here's what I will tell you is in my own life, I have watched the love of Jesus radically change people just like him. I've seen situations where I go, that person will never follow Jesus. I don't understand it. It's impossible. And they're living lives of obedience now. It happens through love. It happened because somebody first demonstrated that grace to them and then led them to the truth of Jesus. And so man, for you guys, and this kind of love, this radically different love that just blows people's minds, if we can figure it out, it changes everything. That love will change your life. It'll change your family. It'll change your children. And then it will change the world. Just think about what all the church has done in 2,000 years. It's incredible. And God's just getting started. If we will show the love of Jesus through grace and truth, he will blow us away by what he does through that. Let's pray.